Welcome to the Mile High Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Daniel Knowles. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are joining us um, in the world. As you know, we're at mile high altitude, 5,280 feet, where we look forward to seeing you in September of 2023 for the 11th uh, 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 mile high chiropractic movement weekend. And we look forward to seeing you there. Of course, look at get the details at riseuptomilehigh.com. Uh, and wherever you are watching or listening to this, whether it be on YouTube or Stitcher or iTunes, make sure you hit subscribe so you are always dialed into Mile High Tech. And today, I'm really thrilled to have as a guest the one and only Martin Rosen. Uh, he's a 1981 graduate of Life. He originally went to Sherman and then uh, shifted over to Life when the accreditation shifted. And for four decades, he's been helping people beyond his practice, helping people really strive in clinical excellence um, in pediatrics and all his different areas of focus. He was a past um, SOT president of SOTO and Sourcey Research and, and a Sourcey Research Board member and instructor for the ICPA. He has so many talents and gifts, and you probably see many of his programs uh, around the world. He'll be coming to Colorado uh, three times in in this coming year, which is super exciting. I'm sure a lot of Mile High docs will will get to benefit a lot from that. And thank you for joining us today, Dr. Martin Rosen. Danny, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're looking forward to this conversation and really looking forward to being out in Colorado this year, um, as you said, three times. So we're looking forward to meeting some of the Mile High people and and staying involved and, and teaching. So again, thank you for having me. Can't well, wait we're to excited me. to have you oh. here. And, and I just learned something new about you, which is at mm -hmm. some point you lived in Boulder, where I live. That's, That's right. I did. exciting. So I you did. you're familiar with Mile High territory. I am very familiar. And then my daughter also lives in Longmont. And she's been there, I think, 10 years now. So we've been out there a lot. We've actually been out there a lot. Good, good. Well, it's yeah. a great place to visit. That's why yeah. I, I totally always encourage people to make, make, when you come to a program, whether it's Dr. Dr. Rosen's program or Mile High or things, make sure you get some time to see the scenery. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you got fired up about chiropractic. Uh, and that took off for you. Um, you some people get fired up and then it fizzles and some people get fired up and then it becomes a passion and a purpose. Right. Um, talk a little bit about how you found your way into chiropractic, first of all, so people get to know you a little bit personally. Sure. So I found my way into chiropractic during that same period of time when I lived in Colorado. I also lived in California and um, I had left school. I was, you know, doing studying pre-law, decided I didn't want to do that. And I had been exposed to chiropractic in the past. Um, I had been under chiropractic care since I was about 19 years of age. And it always made a lot of sense to me. And when I was in California deciding what I wanted to do, one day, thought just literally popped into my head, said, you should go back to school and go to chiropractic school. And I was like, mm, that sounds interesting. And next day, my father called me up and said, hey, um, your grandmother who just passed away in Florida and left you $5,000. I'm like, hey, chiropractic school. So I packed <laughs> up my bag. Um, moved back to New York, took my prerequisites and went to chiropractic school and never looked back. Um, I met my wife at Sherman in 1978. Um, you know, we travel, we would travel on this road together. As I said, we taught our first seminar actually at Sherman on SOT in 1979. And teaching was just such a passion of mine as, as opposed to, as well as being in the office that for the last 40 years, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of seminars and thousands of doctors we've been able to int been introduced to and been able to be touched by. So it is my life and it is my passion. And I, I know I see all the things that you send out and, and share and have seen recording, you know, see, I haven't gotten the pleasure of seeing you present, but I've, I've, right. I've gotten to hear some, watch some of your stuff and your passion definitely comes through, which excites me. Um, and, and I've got to, I've got to ask this relative. So how did you discover, since you said, sacral occipital technique was something you were doing early on, how, how, you know, and even teaching when you were in school. How did you get introduced to that? <laughs> okay. So I, so here's a simple story. I was an upper cervical practitioner. I went to Sherman, toggled everything. You know, I mean, my, my triceps would just go in a spasm when I sat down, you know, I see a neck and boom, they would fire. <laughs> um, toggle, 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 toggle. So my wife one day was taking a seminar at Sherman from this guy who was teaching SOT. And she came back from the seminar and being the, you know, the typical kind of student, upper cervical guy thinking, blocks, really? I mean, come on. So anyhow, she adjusted me, 
for the first time with SAT blocks and I went off to work. At that time, I was working um, at a place called the Bond Dinner Theater. Anyhow, I went to work and within a half hour of being at work, I couldn't walk. I was dragging my leg and um, I called her up. I said, I can't walk. What happened? She goes, I don't know. I just took this. So the bottom line is I came back. You know, I, I had to leave. I literally had to leave work. And let me preface it by saying I never had a problem with that leg in the past. Never had an issue. I went. We. She took me to the person who was teaching the seminar, explained what we had done wrong, adjusted me about two times, and I, could, I was able to walk. And my thought was, if something is can do this much damage in such a short period of time, being so powerful, that used for the greater good, I can't imagine what it would be. So I went. I spent probably two or three years in school doing SOT and upper cervical. I would, you know, check everybody's atlas and access, toggle it out of me, but do all the blocking. And then as time went on and I got more intimate with the SOT technique, I saw that a lot of the upper cervical work, the, the dural restriction work that, you know, and that we do, I could do within the SOT paradigm. So I just kind of translate everything over. What was great though for me is I had the same philosophical construct which made it really good. I had that same basic neurological construct that we always have. So I never fell into, you know, the whole fix it um, diagnostic thing. I was able to use SOT as a modality to basically um, help the nervous system heal, increase functional potential. And once you get the functional potential, your next step is pediatrics. Excellent. You know, I, I don't, I, I don't know. You probably don't know this, but the first chiropractic care that I had was actually SOT. Wow, no, I did not know that. Yeah, I, I had very severe allergies growing up. Right. Right. And uh, my mom brought me to the, uh, you know, someone said to her, you've got to bring this kid to a chiropractor. It was really miserable. Um, I couldn't function in school. And she brought me to just the particular chiropractor was that the nearest one she found. And I don't, I just remember um, the x-rays and seeing the curvatures of my spine right. at the time. And I remember being put on the blocks, you know, and laying there That's and amazing, the allergies right? went away and they never came back. That actually was enough for my mom to go to chiropractic school because she was, yeah, she was doing prereqs and wasn't sure <laughs> what she was going to do, what, what kind of healthcare provider. But when my health changed, she just said, this is what I'm going to do is chiropractic. That's awesome. Well, I remember talking also, I know Network, one of the techniques that Network has based some of their work on is SOT. I know right. I remember talking to Donnie, you know, a number of years ago, and SOT was always part of that five paradigms right. of different techniques. And you, yeah, it deals with the meningeal system. You know, right. it deals with so the it deals with the primary subluxation. That's how Dijonet started it. You know, it's about deal, finding that primary subluxation and removing it. So, yeah, it fits in yeah. great. So, so, uh, so then, then what would you say is your, has been your driving force through your career? The chiropractic paradigm. I mean, it's really that simple for me. I totally believe it. I live it. My children have been brought up in it. They actually believe it, not forced upon them, but it, it it's internalized with them. It's, it's a process that really clicked for me. You know, it's the kind of thing I remember talking uh, to Joe Felicia many years ago, for those of you who don't know him, Joe started yep. Renaissance with Guy Regan. I know you know him, but he always he always would say things like, you know, when you're doing a report of findings and you're talking to patients and you find yourself talking longer and longer and doing like a healthcare talk, he goes, you've already lost them. It's the ones that it clicks right away that you know the shorter time you spend talking to them about what you do, the longer they'll be in your office. And, and I was just blessed. The two chiropractors that I went to when I first started, one was a man named Dr. Spina. And the other is the guy I'm sure you know, Joe D'Onofrio. His mm -hmm. son is still working at Sherman. He was my chiropractor who sent me to school. And they oh, really? Just, I didn't know that. Joe, Joe D. Senior? Was, Joe D. Senior was my chiropractor. Ah, I didn't know yeah. that. We used to go there. He had a box on the wall. And you'd go in and, you know, whatever times it was, you'd get adjusted. And my, I have to say, as a young um, man, one of the most impressive things was Joe had a home office. And next to it, he had a little carport. And in the carport was parked his gold Corvette. And so I felt that was quite an impressive uh, statement as a chiropractor. But yeah, so I went, so Joe D'Onofrio was actually the, the man who sent me to Sherman. He wanted, you know, he said, you have to go to a straight school. And I really, I had no other basis in chiropractic than that. So the passion, I've seen the changes, like, just like you said, I've seen the changes in myself. I've seen the changes in my family. I see the changes in my practice. I see the way people change and grow. And it's a, it, you know, if I'm, I always say this, if I'm feeling sick, 
or I'm feeling tired, or I just don't feel when I go into my office and I start working within an hour of getting within that rhythm, it's like it all changes. It's a healing yeah. environment. It's like, you know, I could drag myself out of bed, crawl down the stairs, think I'm going to die. And like once the energy starts pumping and once that energy is there, so there is such an energy around chiropractic and the understanding of the chiropractic and the nervous system and you connect, you know, you do network. So, you know, when you, when you adjust somebody, you're getting adjusted too half the time. You right. know? And so right. It's that passion that keeps driving and driving. And every time I think about, you know, retiring or quitting, it's like, I go back into the office and all of a sudden I have one of those days where like, that was magical. That yep. was amazing. And yep. teaching is the same thing. Being with Kyra, especially during COVID this year, like we kept teaching in Boston. They kept limiting us saying, you know, you can only have 20 people, 10 people. And we had people who flew from all over the country to come to the seminars and being with like-minded people who were energized, who were not afraid, who saw the big picture, who had a big vision. And even if it was just 20 of them teaching with them, it, it I mean, it's selfish, but it uplifts me. It changes me. And so that is where my passion comes from. It, I don't, can't imagine what else I would do. You know, I, I didn't, um, <laughs> I didn't know I was going to go to chiropractic school. Uh -huh. In fact, I was convinced I was not going to be a chiropractor and uh -huh. not do what my parents did. It was the last thing I sure. wanted to do. Of course. <laughs> and when I went to Sherman, you mentioned, during, I went down to Sherman just to visit. Right. Because my parents were going out. So I was tagging along on the trip uh -huh. and I went to Lyceum and under the tent, I sat, uh -huh. Reggie spoke, yep. Joe, Don, Joe D'Onfrio Sr., right. Arno, and Donnie. Not in that order, but those four. And I Doesn't sat matter, there. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'm going to be a chiropractor. By the time the three yeah. or four hours was done, you know. Well, that's what happened to my wife. My wife's best friend, her father was a chiropractor. He graduated in Palmer in, I don't know, 1950, somewhere in that period. But anyhow, yeah. and they went down to Lyceum. My wife went there. She saw Joe Felicia. Guy Reekman, Reggie Gold, um, those three at least. And she goes, that was it. She was done. She was like, that's it. I'm going to be a chiropractor. You know, she up <laughs> stuff from New Hampshire. Like I never would have met her otherwise. I mean, she's right. a, you know, Irish Catholic from New Hampshire. I'm raised Jewish from the Bronx. Um, never the twain would have met if it wasn't for chiropractic school. And, there you uh, go. There yeah, you go. she just signed up. And the same thing, you know, Sherman had back, especially back then. I So I went Sherman in 78. There was just... An intense, I mean, it was a bunch of hippies that right. literally went to Sherman right, back then. Right, right, you know, right. people I know and, and people I know that work with Donnie, you know, people like Rob Edelhauser and, and Larry Zaleski. Yep. I'm sure you know those names. Yep, they were in my I class. Do. Yeah, those guys were in my class. And it was just, it was an experience. I don't know what else to say. It was, yeah, it yeah. was like an experience and it yeah, carried its way through. Sure. I, so I got to ask this. Um, yeah. A lot of people, I don't, I feel like, and I could be wrong, so please correct me. Right. Schools don't get, people don't get necessarily get introduced to SOTM as much in school as they, do they, or do they? So they do, so I don't know what it is now, but almost most of the schools that I know have either SOT in the program or as an electrum. Okay. Like, you know, I know that Sherman added it because I remember talking to you know, Genofrio and I sent a friend there, so they added it as elective. Life had it actually as one of the classes. Mm -hmm. Alma had it. So, so the big schools did have it. Um, the California schools also had SOT. So either it's usually in the curriculum or as an elective or an advanced course. So it is there and it's available for people. Um, so, yeah, that's my choice. Now, where, where there is now, I'm not as involved in schools, so I don't know. But I know Life still has it. I know Palmer, um, Palmer still has it, both Palmer East, you know, Palmer East and West, both, both cards. Life has it. Life West had it. So yeah, it's still it's still pretty prevalent in a lot of the schools. Because I think it's a really a part of the brilliance of chiropractic Absolutely. that very few people get introduced to, sadly. Right. Um, or not as many as I'd like to see get introduced to it. If, for those that don't know anything about SOT, briefly, because I want to ask you about a few other things, but can sure. you briefly tell people a little bit about its origin? Sure. So the origin of, of SOT was by a man named Major DeJournette. He graduated chiropractic school in 1924. He was an engineer. 
He was a chiropractor. He also studied osteopathy with people like Sutherland. And short version is he got injured severely in an explosion in a Ford Motor Company a plant. He couldn't work. He was really depressed, devastated. And he ended up getting his life back through chiropractic and cranial work, through osteopathy. He got his life back. And so he just threw himself into chiropractic, but went to chiropractic school, as I said, graduated in 1924 and started developing chiropractic. He was he was a genius. If you read his books now about what he found about physiology and anatomy, it's things we're discovering now that he did with literally no tools, just inserted. Right. it. And what he basically thought is the short version is human beings subluxate. And when they subluxate, they create compensatory patterns. If you don't catch that compensatory pattern in the first seven years of life, then that becomes a pattern that they comp compensate with for the rest of their life and becomes a primary source of stimulus. And the category system is the layers of subluxation that pile on top of it. So SOT was designed to find where the person was at that point in time. And then for our lack of a better term, peel the onion. And try mm -hmm. and get down to that primary subluxation, which we, which people are usually functioning from if they become subluxated as a child, and reduce, reduce, reduce or remove that subluxation. So he totally believed that pediatric chiropractic care was a must for at least the first seven years of life. He he wrote that several times that that is extremely important that the pediatric spine should be checked, evaluated, and corrected for at least the first seven years of life. Otherwise, those will create primary subluxations that people will live for the rest of their wow. lives. Wow, then that, that's why that's why pediatrics is very important to you. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it. You've been in practice a while. I've been in practice a while. And you want the person who comes in complaining that they're, you know, they have sciatica, they have ridiculous syndrome, they can't move their left arm, they have headaches, their spine, spine is deteriorated, or you want a brand new newborn baby that is ready to express their potential and just has some interference in the nervous system that when you make the adjustment, you release that interference and they can manifest their optimal potential. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. And the other piece is, you know, chiropractic talks about functional potential. And in my world, the time to lay down those functional potential um, baselines is in the first, actually, I think the first two years of life is the most important time for chiropractic care to start. And that's when the nervous system is developing its baseline, do underlying pro principles, underlying foundation. So yeah, so pediatrics to me is a passion, um, not only because of my understanding of how important it is, but also because like many of us, you go to chiropractic school, we got married, we had a baby, and then we have this beautiful being that we know needs chiropractic care, but no one taught us how to do it. Like when I went to school in 78, 81, there was very few pediatric seminars or classes. So we had to find a way to, and as my older daughter will say, she was my experiment many times, you know, learning pediatrics. So that's where the passion comes in is having a child of your own, first of all, and seeing those changes and then working with infants and watching little miracles happen day in and day out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Well, he, 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 so so tell us about then your pediatric program, sure. your pediatric certification program. I know you talked for yeah. the ICPA for a while. I talked for the ICPA for 15 years. Uh -huh. I loved it. Amazing organization. Um, and the only reason that I stopped teaching for the ICPA was a matter of time. We were running about 22 to 28 weekends a year teaching um, and was getting burnt. And that included the ICPA in our own program. And we're just kind of getting a little burnt out. And I decided that I wanted to expand. My ICPA program was kind of a touchstone for what I actually teach. So we had in the we had in the works developed a pediatric certificate program, and I wanted to teach it. And since it's three seminars, sixteen hours each, so that you're talking about you know forty eight hours, we needed time to do that. So now we have our online program, and we have a hands on program. The online program is a ten month course that you can take online. Oh wow! Yeah, it's a ten month course, and we basically if you take that program, we drip out videos every week. Um, you get PDF workbooks. You get full transcripts, and then Nancy and I do uh, doctor sharings twice a month for that. Plus, you get a five, private Facebook group that you can answer questions, work with that. That's our online 10-month pediatric certificate program. And then our hands-on program are three seminars. First one is spinal. Second one is cranial. And the third one is kind of an integration and in common conditions. And that's what we're doing in Florida next year and also Colorado. And those are each seminar is 16 hours each. So it's 48 hours. At the end of either one of those, if you choose to, you could take a, certif a certification exam. 
either online or in person, and it's hands-on and it's a written exam. So that's a big part of our program. We also teach a bunch of other courses. Um, we teach a bunch of stuff on vagus nerve involvement, do vestibular, I teach SOT courses, um, chiropractic manipulative reflex techniques. So all that stuff is either online and hands-on. And that's all through our new company, which is Peak Potential Institute, which Nancy and I started during COVID. Um, and so, yeah, so it's the Peak Potential Institute and it's on peakpotentialprogram.com, has all our classes, all our seminars. So yeah, we're excited. It's and what's, really, the, what's the URL for that? So people, I'll, I'll put it in the notes. No, right. It's peakpotentialprogram.com. Excellent, excellent. And that has okay. all our all our programs. And, That's um, phenomenal. So there'll be lots yeah. of opportunities for that around the world. And, yeah. and I'll tell you, this is something that's near and dear for me um, that I don't see enough in the profession. And from listening to you, I, I feel it's it's likely near and dear for you as well. Which is this um, clinical excellence. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, my impression is there's a lot of not doing mediocre care. And I don't mean by a particular type of care, SOT, diversified. No, it doesn't matter, right? Non right. That's not it. Uh, what are some keys? In my impression of you just listening to you yeah. is that delivering the, the greatest level of clinical excellence you can for subluxation analysis is vital to you. Right. What are some things that make someone a clinically excellent chiropractor? So, of their approach. Doing it. Yeah. So, basically, you know, they say that to become an expert at something, it takes 10,000 hours of study. That's like the baseline. So when you take seminars that say Monday morning mastery, I run, I run. There's no such thing as Monday, Monday morning mastery. And so my people around me, my family could have said that I'm, sometimes I could be very critical about how people do things. Well, I'm that same way about myself. And so what I really do is I practice my art. I study it and I practice it and I'm willing. And I think what makes someone an expert is always being open to learning. And another thing is, I know it's a tough thing in chiropractic, especially in the straight chiropractic world is, but I take personal responsibility for what I do with my adjustment. Now that doesn't mean that if the person doesn't get well, it's my fault, but it does mean that if I'm adjusting somebody and their par parameters are not changing Besides looking at what they're doing, I want to look at what I'm doing. And right. so I'm willing to, I'm literally willing to look at myself and go, where's my responsibility in that? Like, did I make the proper adjustment? Was that the right timing? Was that the right force? Was that the right adjustment? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, SOT, some people have a hard time because it is a very intricate system. There's a high learning curve. But what I love about that is that it also gives me such a broad base to look. So it's rare that patients will plateau in our office because I always have another tool in the toolbox. That's what I love about it. You know, when it comes to like cranial work as well, you know, if I'm doing spinal adjusting and things aren't changing, I go, well, let's look at the cranium, you know, only 80% of the central nervous system is there. So it gives me a broad base. So I think what could, what creates expertise is number one, the willingness to take responsibility mm -hmm. for what you do. Number two, and the biggest thing, it's your level of commitment. In anything in life, your results are based on your level of commitment. So it's your knowledge, getting the knowledge base of what you have, mm -hmm. making the commitment, right? And then the responsibility becomes what is, you know, what is your, what are you looking at yourself? How do you earn yourself? But the commitment is the big thing. That's the thing that people really need to, to take under their belt is how much time, effort, and energy are you willing to commit? Whatever it is, whether if you're an investment advisor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're running a marathon, what, you know, I mean, you know, you're a runner, right? You know, it's like, I think I'm, I think I'm going to run. I'm going to do a marathon. I'll train like two hours, you know, two hours a week. You know, you can't do that. You right. can't do that. So when you want to do your best, it's a training. I used to do that in my office. Um, I still do it, though, obviously less now because of, you know, I've been practicing so long, but it's that is so to make yourself an expert, I would say it's the willingness to commit to the art and number two, to be able to look at yourself and see and to find somebody, a mentor who is as good or has or you have the same level of respect for and learn from them. I was lucky. You know, my daughter always says, Dad, you know, you were so lucky. You had people like Dijonette was there. You had Logan was there. You had Thompson. You had Pierce. All these guys were like, gone. These all guys were alive. Um, Van Rump. So all the masters of the program, all the people that were still alive when I was born, and I went to all those seminars. I took Activator from Arlen Fur. I took DNFT from Van Rump. You know, I learned all these all these techniques from some of the best. Um, and I think that gives you a target. 
Mm -hmm. Let it go. And, you know, I think that's what you need. It's, I think there's nothing. I mean, you learn from people who you respect and who maybe have reached the pinnacle of success that you want to reach and learn from them. Be willing to learn from them. That's well, the there's thing. two words I heard in that that are super important, which are it's um, outcomes. Being right. your outcomes, you use the word parameters, right? right. And right. accountability, being right. accountable to those. You know, we we're, right. I'm sure you still feel like you're improving. Absolutely. <laughs> I do. It's, it is. And, I do right. too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I say, like, I'm like, wow, I'm, this is be so much better than I was last month. You know? Right. So two things happen. So you get older, your physicality changes. Okay. So, th so once your physicality changes, then there is always something else that kicks in. So, you know, so to me, it's that unconscious knowledge and competence and the stuff that's internalized in my body that I can see different ways of doing things that maybe my physicality might be limited. Like right now, I don't really want to side posture a guy who weighs 285 pounds because mm -hmm. it's too tough on my shoulder, you know? So there are other ways to do that. So yeah, I think that as you get older and as you learn more, you change. I mean, I watch myself adjust or see myself adjust now and I'm like, Wow, that was so different than I was doing three or four years ago. You know, you can see that with chiropractors. You see that with people you teach. I, you know, my daughter, for example, um, when was practicing with us for a number of years, and as she started practicing, when she would adjust me, there was a point at some point, probably somewhere like two or th two or so years after she got out of school, where it clicked. You could see it click from when she adjusted me. It was a whole different world, right? You know, and you can feel that, and I'm sure that's the same on you. Patients can feel that it's an internal process, you know, especially babies. People always say the same thing. She goes, I can't believe Johnny's lying still for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, because Johnny knows what's happening is okay and it's safe and it's, you know, it's improving how he functions. He's not afraid. And, and you, the same thing with, you know, animals, when you're just animals, it's an intuitive connection. They know they're, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to get hurt. So I think that your nervous system changes, your vibration changes as you practice. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I've noticed, I, I keep my eyes a little bit on the profession, what I see going yeah. around. And I'm noticing to me, uh, things I'm seeing is one is I'm seeing somewhat of a renaissance relative to the philosophy yeah. and, and subluxation and right. adjustment focused care. Uh, yeah. I think we've gone out of the dark ages and I think more people are realizing that there's, there's something to this art of chiropractic thing. And then I also see more people really hungry to get better at the art. Yes. Why is focusing on the art important? So if you think of, chiropractic as the triad that it is, philosophy, art, and science, right? And you think of that as a triangle, all sides of that triangle have to be really strong. But in my world or my belief system, the limiting factor is the art. So in other words, if you're a great marketer with a strong philosophy, you can get 100 new patients in a month, but you can't keep them if you don't have the art or the skill set to basically meet their expectation. If you're telling somebody they're going to reach their optimum potential and that you're clearing out their nervous system, they have to have some empirical evidence, either internally or externally, that that's happening. And the only way that that can happen is through developing the art. So, for example, you know, this marketing is not my forte, obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of Luddites when it comes to the marketing strategies that are out there. And my older daughter is like a marketing genius. And she kind of just looks at us and laughs. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we send her an edge goes, you can put that out if you want to. But regardless of that, fact, I also don't want 100 new patients in a month, because I can't handle them at this point. But the point is that, so if you're a good marketer, you get the people in. And if you're a good salesperson, you can get them to sign up for a certain amount of care. But if they don't get the results, if the internal process for them doesn't click, at some point, they're just going to leave. They're going to leave the practice and you have to start the whole process again. But if you have the, it's like a restaurant. So if you have a restaurant that has a master chef and people know about it, people will wait months to get into them. They will have a waiting list practice. They will go there with high expectations. They have to meet the expectations. People will pay the price for that food. Well, chiropractic is the same way. If you go to someone's office who has mastery of their art, master their skill set, and you and you not only meet their expectation, but actually go slightly above their expectation, they're yours for maybe not life, but for a really, really long period of time. And that's why I think the art is so important. The other piece is why I think it's so important is because over the years, maybe a little bit better now, 
When I started in chiropractic, if someone went to a chiropractor and had a bad experience, they wrote off the entire profession. Oh, like yeah. That's it, chiropractor stuff. It's a little Absolutely. bit better now, but I feel if there's people out there not doing justice to the chiropractic adjustment, that they're hurting me and my <clears throat> profession as well. So they have a responsibility yeah. to be as good as they can be. Now, that doesn't mean that every patient that walks in your office gets well and is happy, yeah. but it's also great to be able to have the skill set, and this happens all the time, to know when to refer somebody, but to keep within the chiropractic paradigm. <laughs> right. If they're not getting certain results, and there's a chiropractor down the road who does a different technique, maybe that's someone you should refer to, you know, to keep the chiropractic paradigm alive, as opposed to, you know, saying, well, you know, my, you this adjustment didn't work, chiropractic doesn't work. So the art is really important in that venue as well, for you to know where your limits are, and that there are other people out there that have skill sets that, you know, you may not have that can help. Yeah. And also, I think that's why it's very important to uplift clinical excellence, because there's a lot of yeah. lack of that and that right. does you're right it doesn't right. matter if the person's upper cervical or network or, right. or constant or sot if they're not delivering excellent care it does impact the whole profession right. you know i you know i was as i said i was lucky back in the day to be adjusted by some of the best and people always go well, what's the best technique and i'm like you know what the chiropractors that I've been adjusted by that have the best adjustments were the people that were focused in their technique. It had nothing to do with what they think. I remember going to an activator seminar. It wasn't on and fur, but whoever he was second in command at the time adjusted me with an activator. It was an amazing adjustment. I got adjusted by Van Rupp, you know, DNFT. It was an amazing adjustment. I got adjusted by Donnie Epstein. Um, amazing adjustment. You know, I got adjusted by people in the SOT world um, that were high up there. And, and it's so, it's the people who are focused on their art you know it's it's just like art it's art right is van gogh better than gogan better than renoir you know better, better it, it's it's a different skill set but they're all masters and that's where the art comes in being a master of what you do um that will make the difference in your practice that'll change your life uh, well and i th really think it's that there's an analysis versus just hitting the high spots or something now there's yeah. actually an, an analysis and protocol and looking for an outcome so now I'm sure that also equates to success, success in practice. Right. So what are, what are some things about creating internal success in your practice? Well, so the big thing is, is the best way to build your practice is internally. I mean, it's simply as that internal marketing is so much more effective. So you're, the building of your practice in my world has been based on two things. So for me, it was really on um, philosophy and my art. And what I meant by philosophy back in the day when I started out, we did lectures everywhere. I lectured to whoever would listen to me, you know, Italian American club, um, health clubs, any any person that would listen to me. I mean, I was doing like five to seven lectures a month to people talking the chiropractic story. And I kept talking the chiropractic story. And once I got the chiropractic story, I mirrored that story. So you basically, it's about walking your talk. Your office should be a mirror of your philosophical constructs. You know, if you're a, if you're a straight or subluxation-based chiropractor, then that's what your office should be saying. And that's what it should, people should be feeling and hearing. So in my office, because pediatrics is my focus, as soon as people walk in the door, the first thing they see is this big wall. <coughs> Excuse me. We have 200 pictures of all the little kids in our practice. It's this wall. Then as soon as they face the front desk to make their appointment and tell where to go, there's another video screen that flashes information about pediatrics and kids. So when you walk into my office, if you don't know within the first 10 minutes that chiropractic is good for kids, we hear kids, then you're just, you're just out of your mind, all right? So it's about walking your talk and marketing for the kind of people that you want. I used to be, you know, when I first started practicing, a lot of you, um, when you start practicing, you, you want to open your heart, open your doors and take in anybody that walks into your office, you feel there's a reason for it and you want to serve them. And that is great. That is awesome. And that's how I built my practice. And so at one point I was like a sports SLD chiropractor. I did TMJ, you know, I did all this kind of things that I incorporated but over the years, whatever speaks to you, you start to hone that place into your practice and you basically stay in your lane for a while. And when you're staying in your lane there, you can build a phenomenal practice, literally a waiting list practice, because everything you do is congruent. 
You know, I remember anytime I would join a gym or I'd go to a new, you know, a new organization and join them, people would start talking to me. And within the first two weeks of belonging to whatever this organization, people would start calling and coming into my office. I said, mm -hmm. Oh, I met Dr. Rosen and blah, I met Dr. Rosen here, I met Dr. Rosen there. And it wasn't a marketing, it's just it was my lifestyle, it was what I believed. And then when they walked into my office, it was congruent. And then when they got adjusted, it was congruent. You know, and when I scheduled them and talked to them about their care, it stayed congruent. So I want to back up just for one thing, because you said something that really is dear, near and dear to me. You talked about the evaluation protocol. Yes. There are two points, I think, in your practice that make or break you. Yeah. The first is your exam. The second is your report of findings. Mm -hmm. That's where you, because that's where you're spending the most time with your patient. You know, you're not spending, you know, the exam takes a longer time. The report of findings takes a long time. The adjustment, depending on your practice, is maybe five minutes. You know, it, it all depends on your practice. But the bottom line is, it's those two points. So your exam is your baseline where you first connect with the patient, but you also get a neurological baseline. And so you, you get that neurological baseline from which you're going to work from. So it's really important to have a thorough and a good exam to know where, when, and how to make the best adjustment. The second visit in my office, I don't adjust on the first visit, um, is the report of findings where I go over what I find, I connect with the patient, and I talk to them about their care plan before I adjust them. Um, and I can, that's the second time where you commit and you connect with them. And then throughout the care, you need to back up into the place. So let's say three or four weeks in the care, I'm going to go over some of these exam findings to see how they've changed so that you can get an objective parameter of how their nervous system is changing. Not like, oh, if their headaches have gone away or their neck pain feels a little better, but an actual objective parameter. And it keeps backing up to those first two visits because you do little mini, you know, a progress exam, a little report. So you're constantly reinforcing why they're here and what you do. And in my experience, if you want patients to stay for a long period of time because they understand what you do, that's one of the best ways to do it. Yep. Yep. And that's a central, that's a central part of uh, what we do in our office and also what I teach people. And right. I think it's a central part for anybody who's going to strive for clinical excellence because it's part of that accountability and outcome assessments. Yeah. Not just exactly. for the patient, but for you. Right. Right. Have you making a change that you promised? Right. You know, I, I did that the other day. I showed somebody my notes and I was showing them that she couldn't read my notes because Someone transcribes my notes. I still write them by hand, but then my staff puts them on the computer. And I was showing her, you know, how it looked like if you turn it upside down, it's a graph. But I said, you know, when Johnny first came in, we were doing all this work on him. And now he's all the way down here. And this is all we have to adjust now. He says, this graph. So we know he's stabilizing his whole these adjustment protocols. And that's why I'm going to put him on now once a week. And she just looked at it and went, oh, yeah. And then, of course, on the head, she looked, yeah, you know, he's pooping regularly. He's sleeping more. She had all the symptom reasons. But I can literally show her a graph of how his adjustment protocols were changing and that his subluxation pattern was reducing. And that was why I changed his visit frequency, not because he was pooping better or sleeping better or you know or his nose wasn't as congested so it's a really good idea to have a paradigm again that supports what you're telling people you know if you're if you're telling people that you're not basing your care on symptoms and then you're basing your care on symptoms there's an incongruency there and that incongruency will will bite you in the butt at some point yeah absolutely absolutely so so uh tell us about the first program that you're having coming out in colorado in april i think it was you said oh um, yeah first one is in april so again it's Part one. Now we have people who jump in at any point in time. We had some, we have people who take the third one. So part one is spinal examination adjusting protocols. So we go through a complete exam, a whole indicator system, and then adjusting protocols for the full spine, both the tonal adjustments and structural adjustments when they're necessary, when they're not. So we cover all that in that first exam, first um, class. The second one, which is going to be in July, is cranial, and it's the same format. We go through an entire cranial examination, evaluation protocol, and go through when you make cranial adjustments, what type to make, whether it be internal or external, when to make them, and what your indicators are for it. Then the third one, which is going to be the end of September, and that's if we call it common conditions now, but it's kind of clinical integration. So it uses a lot of the protocols from the spinal and cranial. It integrates the exam, and it does cover certain specific um, subluxation patterns that we often find with certain common conditions in the pediatric practice. So we integrate cranial, spinal, and some soft tissue techniques in that third seminar. Um, and that's that's what our whole program is. But like I said, people have jumped in at different points of time. We've had people take the third one first. Um, a lot of people like the cranial, and it's always the 
the, the you know the the biggest one always because people feel if they have a spinal package and they want to move on to cranial a lot of people can take that so you can either take them individually or you can take the whole program and if you go on the website that we talked about peakpotentialprogram.com it gives you those options you can also mix and match what i mean by that is florida we're also doing in january february and oh june i think it is no, January, February, May in Florida. So if you want to mix and match and take like level one in Florida, level two in Colorado, you can do that as well. Any way that you want to do that, you can do that. And if you can't get there, then you can do our online program. We, we're we releasing another one. Um, we're finishing up one. We have one, another one running and the next one will be opening up registration in November on this month. So yeah, we're, we're keeping busy. We want to keep teaching. We want, you know, we want you people, you know, I there's an old story that I heard Reggie Gold tell. And ah. someone asked Reggie why he stopped practicing. You know why? And he said, well, because I was in my town one day and I went to the movies and I saw all these people that I hadn't adjusted in the movies. He goes, and I was seeing, you know, 700 people a day, which probably was true with Reggie. Like seeing like 2000 patients a week goes, I'm seeing 2000 patients a week. I can't adjust anymore. And these, all these people here who I'm not adjusting he goes, so I figured the only way I'd get them all adjusted is if I taught people how to adjust and get them into their offices. So I had to stop practicing so I could do that. So <laughs> that's what, that's why it. he said he stopped. So I'm not ready to stop practicing, but there I am, you know, limited to what I can see and who I can see. So what we want, and that's what we do in a certification program is we have a whole um, directory of people who have taken our program. So now we get phone calls. Hey, do you have anybody in Arizona? Do you have anybody in Colorado? Do you have anybody in New Mexico? Do you have anybody in Europe? We now have a certification directory that we can refer people to people that we know are committed to the art of chiropractic. That's so awesome. So awesome. Um, so exciting. And I got to tell you, it's um, you only have a few years on me, not many, but a few. <laughs> and, and I have to say, it's really contagious to hear the passion to be able to, that you exude. I'm sure that comes through in the programs that you do. So yeah. I, I want to acknowledge you and, and thank you for for. Um, you know, giving so much to people to because of that purpose of having more people on more tables, more often getting right. their spines and nerve system cleared out. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the acknowledgement. I, I, I don't know any other way to do it. I mean, I know <laughs> what you do, but I do, but I know what you do. You know, I watch you. I see your stuff online all the time. You see, you're always busy. And, you know, I have not been to Mile High yet. I will get there. Um, but I know it's an amazing program. I know people have spoken there and people have been there. And yeah, you know, hats off to you, man. You're doing this, you're doing the same stuff. And we have an amazing profession. Um, and we have so many passionate people that are in the profession, and we really, really, really need to push the envelope. You know, we saw that in the last two years. We really right. need to push the envelope of what healthcare really is about and to get right. rid of all this fear and this all this other crap that's running around out there. Right, right. Well, well, you know, you'll just have to drive the RV to Mile High territory. That's what we will. We'll be. We're definitely going to be doing that. Sure. We're putting it to bed for three months in New England, um, but we're going to wake it up in March. There um, you go. There you go. Well, that's right. exciting. Well, I, I can't encourage people enough to attend um, one of the Peak Potential programs and also to really commit to delivering the best chiropractic care and, and SOT has got to be something that you learn as part of your chi your chiropractic uh, toolbox and to understand the nerve system more that if you don't ever get introduced to it something you're truly miss out on in terms of the chiropractic paradigm yeah I I have to agree I have piggyback on Dijonet was a, a G he wrote I think they say somewhere between 140 and 150 manuals wow he actually wrote doing research he practiced for 65 years I mean, he was still practicing at 92 when he passed away. So he practiced chiropractic for 65 years, wrote these manuals, taught, and his insight into how the nervous system works, the dural meningeal system, cerebral spinal fluid, all the stuff that we're learning now is so important to the, the health of the nervous system and to our, our, our own particular health. He was talking about this for years and years and years and years. So, yeah. so, so, and, you know, there's so many greats in different areas of the profession. I think people do a disservice if they only learn one particular approach personally. Absolutely. As good as that approach might be, whether it be upper wow. cervical or Gansa, learning more about, there's so many brilliant, brilliant people and minds and artists over the years of our profession. You become such a better practitioner if you learn more. So I, I want to thank you for carrying that torch. 
No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And I want to piggyback on what you said. You know, when I went to chiropractic school, I learned all different techniques and they just, they sunk in. Whatever sunk in are those techniques I took with me. But in my world, I just found the lane, you know, like I, I found the drive that I wanted and I stay with it. But it doesn't mean that all that other stuff that I learned didn't integrate. And, you know, it's it's like growing up, you know, where you are today is, is a, is an outlook of where you've been and what experience you've had. And it's the same thing. So Danny's right. Go out there, learn different experiences. Something will click for you. And when that clicks, it's also because you've had the chance to experience all the other things too. You also don't know when something surfaces in your hands, heart, uh, mind yep. is taking care of a person that then like, oh, I remember this that so-and-so said. And Absolutely. I haven't done it, but wow, for some reason – you get the impression that this is what I need to do with that person that's on the table. Exactly. Exactly. So, yep. so I think I know, I really, I know people are going to enjoy you being out here in the mile high state. Um, and, and thank you for all you do for chiropractic. Oh, thank you. Thank you again for having me and right back at you. Thank you for all you do for our profession. And everyone, we look forward to, you know, definitely look in the liner notes that go along with uh, this podcast, uh, the blog notes to make sure to look up the, the programs. And we look forward to seeing everybody on higher ground in September of 2023. See you in September. Keep changing spines, lives, and minds with chiropractic.